women and natives, recalcitrant subjects. Focus on women's lives has been made an epistemological problem by male ethnographers such as Edwin Ardner and, more recently, Roger Keesing. Ardner attempted to explain men's willingness to provide cultural models for the anthropologist and women's reluctance to do so with the idea of muted discourse. While Ardner was criticised for biologism and essentialism, the boldest argument of his paper, that men and women in different cultures might have separate realities, has been ignored. In Keesing's reassessment of Ardner's theory, he attempts to analyse historic and structural reasons for his previous failures to elicit detailed information about women from women. While Keesing's sex was a large barrier, so was the fact that he was commissioned by Kwayo men to record the custom of their society. Women, not initially seeing their activities as a part of this endeavour, saw no point in talking to Keesing. Keesing concludes that what women can and will say about themselves and their society can never be taken as direct evidence of what they know and don't know, or of women's status. Of course, we might consider whether what men can and will say about themselves and their society is direct evidence of what they know. However, I choose to see Keesing's report as a welcome rejoinder to feminist anthropologists who returned from fieldwork claiming they could not study gender because it was not at issue in that society. Indeed, the fact that it was not at issue may have been the issue. Perhaps women choose not to discuss gender issues with an outsider. I would argue that a feminist anthropology cannot assume the willingness of women to talk, and that one avenue open to it is an investigation of when and why women do talk, assessing what strictures are placed on their speech, what avenues of creativity they have appropriated, what degrees of freedom they possess. Thus far, epistemological problems about women as subjects have been framed in terms of anthropological models, like Ardner's, when much feminist theory outside the discipline takes the problematic of voicing as its starting point. Yet feminist theories of language have not informed ethnography. In fact, I would argue that feminist anthropologists stand to learn not only from women's speech, but women's silences as well. Like Adrienne Rich, we might learn how to plot those silences, very possibly strategies of resistance, in the text. Silence can be a plan rigorously executed, the blueprint to a life. It is a presence. It has a history, a form. Do not confuse it with any kind of absence. According to James Clifford, It is the intercultural dialogic production of texts that constitutes one of the key moments in experimental ethnography. With expanded communication and intercultural influence, people interpret others and themselves in a bewildering diversity of idioms, a global condition of what Bakhtin called heteroglossia. Yet heteroglossia is not a ready-made solution. It assumes voices, most likely male ones, and does not confront problems of coming to voice Experimental ethnography's critique of anthropology's scientific ethos should also explicitly name patriarchy and examine the way in which the scientific voice is at once patriarchal. This voice, Griffin says, rarely uses a personal pronoun, never speaks as I or we, and almost always implies that it has found absolute truth, or at least has the authority to do so. In writing, this paternal voice became quite real to me, and I was afraid of it. You will recognize this voice from its use of such phrases as it is decided or the discovery was made. This is my second feminist critique of experimental ethnography's assumptions. Clifford's analysis of the prospects for experimental ethnography envisions co-authored joint texts. As Rabineau points out, proponents of experimental ethnography go only so far in their critique of anthropological representation they stop just short of calling themselves into question. Marcus and Cushman note that experiments with dispersed authority risk giving up the game. On the contrary, I argue that dispersed authority represents anthropology's last grasp of the other. I am not surprised that no inclusion of work done in ethnic studies or so-called indigenous anthropology is made in experimental ethnography, but I am dismayed. This, 
despite the fact these writings explicitly challenge the authority of representations of themselves. Self-writing about like selves has thus far not been on the agenda of experimental anthropology. To accept native authority is to give up the game. If we have learned anything from anthropology's encounter with colonialism, the question is not really whether anthropologists can represent people better, but whether we can be accountable to people's own struggles for self-representation and self-determination. Paula Gunn Allen, a teacher and critic of Native American literature, argues that when a people has no control over public perceptions of it, when its sense of self is denied at every turn in the books, films, television, and radio shows it is forced to imbibe, it cannot help but falter. But when its image is shaped by its own people, the hope for survival can be turned into a much greater hope. It can become a hope for life, for vitality, for affirmation. Thus, when the other drops out of anthropology, becomes subject, participant, and sole author, not object then, in Kevin Dwyer's words, we will have established a hermeneutics of vulnerability, and an anthropology which calls itself into question. Another way in which feminist theory can make a contribution to the study of colonialism is through a critique of the politics of representation itself. This is my point, alluded to at the outset of this essay, about experimental ethnography not pushing the challenge to traditional anthropology far enough. What would our alternate ethnographic canon look like if it included books like John Langston Gwaltney's Dry Longso, Maxine Hong Kingston's Woman Warrior, or essays like Renato Rosaldo's When Natives Talk Back. This is not a uniquely feminist criticism, but it can be expressed in feminist ways. What would experimental ethnography's concern with the constitution of subjectivities, the politics of identity, look like if it addressed the politics of identification? if it addressed the dynamics of autobiography and community rather than authority and disaffection. For a movement that claims interest in experimenting with how selves are constituted or represented, experimental ethnography has been strangely reluctant to embrace other forms of writing, such as the novel, short story, or autobiography. At a time when literary critics read such texts as expression of culture, why can't anthropologists, novels, much less novels by Zora Neale Hurston or Ella Deloria, would never be considered anthropology in the old canon, but perhaps they can be in the new one. Zora Neale Hurston was trained by Franz Boas as an anthropologist, yet she is known more for her contributions to the Harlem Renaissance than for her contributions to anthropology. In part, this is because Hurston chose not to objectify African-American cultures using normative anthropological approaches but to embed them in the logic of a storytelling tradition. Hurston captures lyrically the idiom and tenor of speech of African-American and Afro-Caribbean communities at particular moments in time, accomplishing what few of her contemporaries in anthropology were able to achieve. My purpose here is not to include an exhaustive survey of her work, since by now the literature on Hurston is exhaustive. I want rather to read her tendency to blur genres and to rely on first-person narration both as experimental and as an early example of feminist ethnographic work. In Hurston's ethnography, community is seen not merely as an object to be externally described, but as a realm intimately inhabited. Thus, Eatonville is a community Hurston returns to again and again in her writing. The first half of her 1935 ethnography, Mules and Men, is set there. Her first novel, Jonas Gordvine, 1934, takes place in Eatonville, and the central characters are modelled after the lives of her own parents, a thread picked up again in her 1942 autobiography, Dust Tracks on a Road. Hurston uses her parents' relationship to explore the construction of gender and its limits in the community in which she was raised. The theme of gender relations is one she explores again in Their Eyes Were Watching God. Hurston's quest to portray black women as speaking subjects is the underlying thread of this novel, as the protagonist, Janie Crawford, sets out to fight the bonds of silence her first two husbands have placed on her. Janie did what she had never done before, that is, thrust herself into the conversation. <laughs> 
Sometimes God gets familiar with us women folks, too, and talks his inside business. He told me how surprised he was about y'all turning out so smart after him making you different, and how surprised y'all is going to be if you ever find out you don't know half as much as you think you do. It's so easy to make yourself out God Almighty when you ain't got nothing to strain against but women and chickens. Some critics, notably Mary Helen Washington, have expressed disappointment in Janie's inability to claim full voice and autonomy. Yet I feel this text can be read as an extended negotiation of gender roles and patriarchy. It is important to realize, however, that Hurston's analysis of patriarchy is often shifting and strategic. For example, Tell My Horse, Voodoo and Life in Haiti and Jamaica is a work that mixes the conventions of the novel with those of the travelogue. It is also a text where Eatonville emerges in the pages of a Caribbean ethnography. Tell My Horse reveals Hurston's own processes of self-fashioning and her attempts to redefine the terms of her womanhood in different cultural contexts. Gwendolyn Mickle observes that Hurston's feminist perspectives emerge most clearly in the section on Jamaica in Tell My Horse. Yet it is perhaps the juxtaposition of Their Eyes Were Watching God and Tell My Horse that reveals most clearly Hurston's cross-cultural reflections on gender roles and patriarchy. In fact, Their Eyes Were Watching God was written while Hurston was still in Haiti, conducting the fieldwork that would become Tell My Horse, revealing an entirely different relationship between the novel and ethnography than that evoked by Malinowski. Hurston composed Their Eyes Were Watching God in seven weeks, during the period of September 1936 to March 1937, when she was in Haiti. It was published when she returned to the United States in September 1937. During the months of February and March 1938, Hurston completed Tell My Horse, and it was published later that same year. Hurston's opening foray on gender roles with a Jamaican man in Tell My Horse occurs the day following a wedding both had attended. Hurston tells her readers, I do not remember how we got around to it, but the subject of love came up somehow. He let it be known that he thought women who went in for careers were just so much wasted material. American women, he contended, were destroyed by their brains. He felt it was a great tragedy to look at American women, whom he thought the most beautiful and vivacious women on earth, and then to think what little use they were as women. I had been reclining on my shoulder blades in a deck chair, but this statement brought me up straight. I assured him that he was talking about what he didn't know. What follows is a spirited but heated exchange between Hurston and her Jamaican visitor, punctuated by scornful snorts and aggravated grunts on both sides. At one point, Hurston chases her interlocutor to the running board of his car when he exhibits an inclination to end the conversation. As Hurston recounts, When I showed a disposition to listen instead of scoffing, we had a very long talk. That is, he talked, and I listened most respectfully. Hurston's use of humour and sarcasm to chip away at patriarchal attitudes here is instructive, and it is worth noting that Hurston concludes this chapter with an account of female ritual specialists preparing young girls for love, which is as eroticised as it is a tongue-in-cheek rendering of her interlocutor's notion of the ideal woman. The whole duty of a woman is love and comfort, she must accept her role gladly, not make war on her destiny and creation. The fifth chapter of Tell My Horse, titled Women in the Caribbean, however, offers a more sustained reflection on her own positioning. It is a curious thing to be a woman in the Caribbean, after you have been a woman in these United States. It has been said that the United States is a large collection of little nations, each having its own ways, and that is right. But the thing that binds them all together is the way they look at women. And that is right, too. The majority of men in all the states are pretty much agreed that just for being born a girl baby, you ought to have laws and privileges and pay and perquisites. And so far as being allowed to voice opinions is concerned, why, they consider that you were born with the law in your mouth. And that is not a bad arrangement, either. The majority of solid citizens strain their ears trying to find out what it is that their womenfolk want, so they can strain around and try to get it for them. And that is a very good idea, and the right way to look at things. Hurston's move here to posit a strategically unified American womanhood without invoking the power differentials between different groups of American women is an important, if problematic, one. 
Notwithstanding Hurston's many controversial positions on race, her intervention here can be read as an attempt to assert an idealised Eatonville to stand for the whole, bypassing a mode of comparison that continually takes white society as the standard measurement. I believe this interpretation is supported by Hurston's varying descriptions of gender relations in Eatonville, where women are portrayed as powerful, if also victimised, and in Hurston's opening chapter for Tell My Horse, in which Jamaican race distinctions are interrogated gently but firmly in her position as an American Negro. She records with humour the attempt of the president of Atlanta University to establish solidarity with his upper-class mulatto audience in Jamaica by beginning his speech with We Negroes, and the panic and consternation this provoked in his audience, noting, When a Jamaican is born of a black woman and some English or Scotsman, the black mother is literally and figuratively kept out of sight as far as possible. But no one is allowed to forget that white father, however questionable the circumstances of birth. You hear about my father this and my father that and my father who was English, you know, until you get the impression that he or she had no mother. Black skin is so utterly condemned that the black mother is not going to be mentioned or exhibited. In speaking for the black mother, a recurrent theme in Jonas Gorvine and Dust Tracks on a Road, Hurston effectively utilizes a critique of patriarchy to simultaneously criticize a racial hierarchy. It is an attempt to reach across cultural boundaries to establish solidarity with women, to make the transition from the observation, this is how women are treated, to the moral statement, this is how women should be treated. If at times Hurston's generalizations seem to claim too much ground, She is also careful to assert difference and specificity, just at the moment she seems to posit an essentialized identity. She portrays at first a bleak picture of Caribbean womanhood. Women get no bonus just for being female down there. She can do the same labors as a man or a mule, and nobody thinks anything about it. In Jamaica, it is a common sight to see a skinny-looking but muscular black woman sitting on top of a pile of rocks with a hammer, making little ones out of big ones. They look so wretched with their bare black feet all gnarled and distorted from walking barefooted over rocks. Yet Hurston as quickly breaks down the picture of woman as victim by asserting class as an analytical category, reminding her readers that upper-class women in the Caribbean have an assurance that no woman in the United States possesses. Like Zora Neale Hurston, Ella Deloria worked with Franz Boas and, like Hurston, never attained recognised professional status in anthropology. While her Dakota Texts, 1932, is a classic for those working on Sioux tribal cultures, her more popularly written ethnography, Speaking of Indians, 1944, is out of print, and her novel Water Lily, while written at the same time, was not published until 1988. With Ruth Benedict's help, Deloria cut and revised Water Lily in 1947, but Benedict's untimely death in 1948 deprived Deloria of the professional assistance that would have enabled publication of the book. The dedication to the book 40 years later still reads, In memory of Ruth Fulton Benedict, who believed in Water Lily. In many ways, Ella Deloria's work presents a contrast to Hurston's. Speaking of Indians was explicitly written to persuade a potentially hostile white audience of the value and worth of Indian lifeways, and attempted to speak frankly about some of the difficulties of reservation life. In 1945, Deloria remarked to a friend that World War II had ushered in an era of practical social science, and American Indian ethnology was no longer perceived as an endeavour with high priority. It is perhaps the wartime context that explains why so much of Speaking of Indians is dedicated to Native American contributions to the war effort. Although Deloria's tone is often conciliatory, she does criticise patriarchal white society. She reasons, for example, that Dakotas fail in business because they sacrifice financial interests for the sake of kin obligations. In recounting the story of a once successful Dakota rancher, Deloria observes... Just when he has some fine, sleek steers ready for market, his mother-in-law dies. What does he do? He neglects his shipping program to attend to a funeral. He kills a beef and gives a big feast. The white neighbors are amazed. Why, the man has gone crazy, stark crazy, they say. What's the matter with him anyway? See, that's the way of the Indian. 
he can't stand up long. They cannot possibly know that Dakota kinship requires the utmost in mutual courtesy between a man and his mother-in-law. His mother-in-law had always treated him well, as he had her. This that he was doing was an indispensable part of the pattern of mutual respect. This has always been so, between son-in-law and mother-in-law. The white man, with his rude and sometimes cruel mother-in-law jokes, cannot understand that. Speaking of Indians and water lily, both emphasize the integrative theme of kinship in traditional Dakota life, and they share some of the same ethnographic anecdotes. Agnes Picot calls water lily a narrative fiction, a plot invented to provide a possible range of situations that reveal how cultural ideals shaped behavior of individual Sioux in social interaction. More specifically, Water Lily carves out a space for the analysis of gender by emphasizing again and again the range of women's roles among the Dakota. Deloria's novel traces the life of the central character, Water Lily, through the lives of her mother and grandmother. Both Water Lily and her mother are married twice. Remarriage is permitted after a death or a divorce, exemplifying three types of marriage practiced by the Dakota. Water Lily's mother, Bluebird, foolishly elopes with a man who later abuses her and finally divorces her by throwing her away publicly. Water Lily's first marriage is contracted through a form of bride price paid for her, but when her husband dies from smallpox, her second marriage, like that of her mother, is arranged by mutual consent. Water Lily had been elaborately bought once. This time she married in the other sanctioned way, the way most women married who had the good sense not to elope the way of mutual agreement, openly declared. Similarly, when Water Lily joins her husband's kin upon marriage, the differences in her positioning with a final as opposed to consanguineal kin are demonstrated again, as they were earlier in the narrative of her mother, Bluebird's, life. She was sure of Rainbow's mother. It was her kinship duty to devote herself to a son's wife, she would even scold her own son if she thought him remiss in his care of his wife, no matter who that wife was, no matter how inadequate she might be. That was the role cut out for mothers-in-law, and few women would neglect it, at least in the open, for fear of censure. But as it happened, Gloku was truly fond of Bluebird. It was Rainbow's sisters Bluebird must be cautious with. She watched herself very carefully, knowing she could irritate them unless she conducted herself with extreme tact. If she should be so stupid as to mistake their tenderness as a personal tribute to herself, rather than for what it was, their way of honouring their brother and his coming child, and if she should overstep her bounds by making absurd demands on their brother, they would instinctively shift their loyalty from her to him. Water Lily is a historical novel that attempts to reconstruct 19th century Dakota life before the tribes were forced onto reservations. It is a richly worked tapestry of relations among women located in a community's pride and struggle to survive not only the conditions of nature, but also smallpox infestations and other portents of the arrival of white society. Texts such as Hurston's and Deloria's speak to the ways in which an analysis of positioning is key to understanding how feminist ethnographers theorize. If in the first group of texts reviewed in this chapter, gender appeared as the primary means of negotiating position, Herson and Deloria's writings expose how race and gender intertwine to establish a feminist ethnographer's positionality. These anthropological novels address relationships of power, not only within culture, but also between cultures, something the bulk of ethnography, experimental or otherwise, has been slow to undertake. Barbara Hernstein Smith, in her seminal essay, Contingencies of Value, reminds us that the entry of marginal texts into the modern curriculum not only opens up the canon, but opens to question the idea of a canon. For what is at stake, as Cornell West reminds us, is not simply the canon, but a cultural and historical crisis, namely, the decolonization of the third world associated with the historical agency of those exploited, devalued, and degraded by European civilization that renders a radical reordering of the canon necessary. If this essay has questioned the place of confessional ethnography, anthropological novels, and writings by people of color in the alternative canon of experimental ethnography, 
perhaps we too can consider the project of feminist ethnography as one that continually challenges the very notion of a canon.